they can. Okay, thank you. Um, but we will, we're gonna let this roll for, so I will walk around. Yes, our sound is turned on, but we're just taking a little tour until 10, and then there will be talking. Thank you. Hello, Facebook Live world. Welcome to the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. My name's Wendy DePaulis, and I'm the curator of art and sculpture here at the Arboretum. Thank you so much for joining us today. We miss you all so much, our members, our donors, our visitors, and our fans. We can't wait to have you back on site, hopefully sometime soon. But in the meantime, we're going to give you an inside look at the Society of Minnesota Sculpture Show. This is their 2020 spring show that was put together and installed on March 11th, right before we closed for COVID-19. Therefore, no one has been able to see this exhibition live, so we're thrilled through the use of this technology, Facebook Live with our social media guru, Susie Hopper on the camera, and I've got Jim monitoring comments in order to make this an interactive event. Now, for those of you who don't know, today is International Sculpture Day, April 25th. Around the world, there are events and most everything virtually happening, um, along with our partner, the International Sculpture Center. So this video will be recorded and sent around the world. So the entire world can see what's happening at the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum when it comes to sculpture. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this event. And thank you for your interest in art at the Arboretum. For those of you outside of the state of Minnesota, you may not know that the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum is part of the University of Minnesota. We were founded in 1958 and host over half a million visitors a year. We have extensive youth and adult programming and in fact, educated 40,000 youth last year alone in nature-based education. That's a lot of children coming to the Arboretum, learning about our earth, learning about conservation and preservation, and it's a great place to do that. 
We also have vibrant research happening here. We have research in grapes that allow us to grow grapes now in all 50 states for winemaking. We also have incredible apple research that has developed my favorite apple, the Honeycrisp, right here at the Arboretum. We also have research going on on trees and shrubs and ornamentals and grasses that you all see in your gardens and around the country every day and may not know they come from right here at the Arboretum. We also have an incredible conservation program that protects rare and threatened species. So as you can see, we're doing a lot, but today we're here to talk about art at the Arboretum. As curator of art and sculpture, I have a mission to connect people to nature through art. We do that in a variety of ways here at the Arboretum. First of all, we have the incredible monumental sculpture garden called the Harrison Sculpture Garden. That resides on our three mile drive. It's over three acres, 26 incredible sculptures from around the world grace that presence. It's the highest point at the Arboretum and it's the sculptures are sited so beautifully and they're in dialogue with each other. It was donated by philanthropists Alfred and Ingrid Lenz Harrison in 2013. Each year we work through education, conservation, and research to make that garden more accessible and uh, to, to uh, all sorts of people that come to visit our garden from around the world. It's an incredible place because you can go there any two days of the year and the sculptures look different. Sometimes snow is resting on them, sometimes there's rain or mist, and sometimes, like today, it's a bright sunny day with blue skies. So we hope that you'll, once we reopen, that you'll be able to come and visit us there. There's works of artists such as uh, Barbara Hepworth, Louise Nevelson, Mimo Palladino, and George Rickey. And as I said, it's a global connection. So not only a lot of women artists are represented, but artists from around the world. So don't miss that this incredible gem that the, was given to us by Alfred and Ingrid. The works are sited around walkways that lead up to a grove of Kentucky coffee trees at the very top. It's a restful place, it's a meditative place, it's a contemplative place, it's an exciting place, it's a place for picnics and a place for weddings. So art at the Arboretum and in nature is at its best in that garden. I also manage the fine art education programs, which a lot of you might not know. We have a lot of uh, programs that don't just encompass painting and drawing, but of course have a lot of those, but also textiles and jewelry, um, woodworking and writing and literature. So we'd love to see you in those classes when we reopen as well. You can find all this information on our website. Now, I'd like to turn our attention to the focus of today's event. For those of you who are just joining us, my name's Wendy DePaulis, and I'm the curator of art and sculpture at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. This exhibit was installed on March 11th, right before the Arboretum was closed due to COVID-19. In this show, we have 28 members of the Minnesota uh, Sculpture Society. There are 63 sculptures being featured. Now, the Society of Minnesota Sculptures has almost 90 members. So not everyone is represented today, but it's a, it's a place that every sculptor in Minnesota has a home. So if you're interested in being a part or learning more about the Society of Minnesota Sculptors, just go on their website and you'll find it. But as it became apparent once we had closed that no one was gonna get to see this event, we looked for ways to explore the virtual world and voila, Facebook Live and this event was born. And I'd like to give you some background on the group of sculptors, um, the Sculptor Society and how it started, because it's fascinating to me that in 1943, Juliana Force, the director of the Whitney Museum in New York, came to the Twin Cities to judge a show at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. She found and commented on the nucleus of sculptural activity that was going on here in the Twin Cities. And as a result of this, enthusiasts at that time who were noted sculptors like Miriam Bennett, Joan Severson, Loris, Harriet Maas, Graham McGuire, Charlotte Mills, Catherine Nash, and Evelyn Raymond all started this Minnesota, what it was called then, the Minnesota Sculpture Group. We're fortunate enough to have some of those 
sculptures by those artists in our permanent collection as well on the over 1,200 acres that make up this Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Their aim to start this group was to stimulate interest in creative sculpture. Pretty simple, right? Just get it noticed. Let's see what's going on in the upper Midwest. Somebody from New York noticed. Let's see if the rest of the world can keep paying attention. So the following year, the combined forces of this newly formed sculpture group and the Walker Art Center sponsored a show that brought entries from Nebraska, Iowa, the Dakotas, and Wisconsin, as well as Minnesota. It was a resounding success. One of the founders, John Rood, of this society said, exhibition is at the heart of all programs to promote any phase of art. Not only is it the chief means of awakening public interest and of extending knowledge of the art form, but it's essential to the stimulation of the artist to continue this lonely expression and to strive for higher quality. Now known as the Minnesota Sculpture Society, their mission is to encourage and help members to do their best work, achieve recognition, and fuel gratification from what they create. I'm happy to say we still have a thriving sculpture community here in the Twin Cities, and I'm pleased to be able to share with you some of the works from this latest show here at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum today. One last thing I'd like to point out, that these works are for sale for the most part. And if you're interested in purchase, you can just contact me, Wendy DePaulis at D-E-P-A-O 008 at umn.edu. The proceeds from all sales of artwork at the Arboretum go to support the local artists and the Arboretum. It's a great way to acquire a meaningful work of original art and support the number one arboretum in the country, as published in USA Today. We will now begin the 2020 Spring Show for the Society of Minnesota Sculpture, Sculptors. And again, if you're just joining us, my name's Wendy DePaulis. I'm the Curator of Art and Sculpture here at the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Let's go. The first uh, work we have here is by James Gabbard. It's called Fragment Two. And sometimes art makes you ask questions and it makes you ponder. And that's what this artwork does. It's, if you look at it closely, this work is a study in contradiction. Is it contemporary or is it 2000 years old? It's a classic body, but a contemporary head. Is it a toga? or a bath towel. It's cracked like stone, but it's bronze. If it's contemporary, why does it have a weathered patina? Is playing with contradictions, it, it is playing with contradictions, and is it contemporary or ancient? As you go through this tour today, ask questions or ponder, either to yourself or on our chat. If you choose to go on to our chat, it'll be monitored by Jim and we'll try to get as many of those questions answered as possible. However, if you don't wanna see those running chats going and you wanna focus more on the artworks I'll be showing, then to hide the comments, just swipe right across your screen. Swipe left to bring them back again. The next work we have here is by Craig Snyder. It's called Mistress of the Deep. Take a moment to look at all sides of this art. With the help of Susie, she'll be walking around these sculptures today. Craig loves taking industrial metals and adding some heat and twists and bends and hammers to make his contemporary works. He uses not only steel, but stainless steel and mixes brass, copper, aluminum, stone, and wood to create his pieces. Craig has many permanent pieces throughout the world. And um, in this show, he has three separate pieces. And this first one is entitled, as I said, Mistress of the Deep, Mama Shark. So if you look at the top, you can see the trio of sharks jumping there. Craig's trying to ask us, how can I make oceans pertinent? And this asks a bigger question. How do artists get people to pay attention 
to environmental disasters such as coral bleaching, to overfishing, or the rapid extinction of sea creatures. Through their art, they create powerful visualizations that pay homage, in this case, to the beauty of the ocean, but also show the devastating impact that humans can have. Craig's chosen the shark, the apex of the ocean ecosystem for which all other systems need to stay in balance. A hundred million sharks are killed every year. That's 200 sharks per minute. As we move over to our next sculpture, we have a work by Kristen Leben called A Study in Stone Bubbles. Stone sculpture is older than civilization itself. The Venus of Willendorf is a four and a half inch tall Venus figure estimated to have been made 30,000 BCE. Limestone, which Kristen has used in this case, is a soft rock and it can have a wide variety of textures, it's composed of the mineral calcite and formed on the ocean floor from sediment and the bodies of early sea creatures. It's great for outdoor sculptures due to its ability to withstand acid rain. Kristen says when she's creating abstract pieces, she enjoys the freedom to explore how different elements create different experiences for the viewer. She also enjoys sliding along the scale of abstraction to find what degree of abstraction she wants the piece to develop. She finds that the more abstract the piece is, the more of the artist there is in the work. She does a lot of work in bronze and steel as well, and figurative work. She likes to explore the positive and negative spaces and how they inform pieces and make it more dynamic. She enjoys employing rhythm. Now rhythm in sculpture and art is a combination of elements repeated, but with variations. And in this case, you can see the differing sizes of similar figures that are repeated. There's variations in order and grouping, but there's definitely a rhythm to it. A rhythm that's easily perceived, but at the same time complex and subtle. Think of water on a beach as it continually breaks on the shore in lines that are repeated, yet each one's different. Just as those waves pull the observer in, Kristen enjoys how this piece can pull an observer in. Again, if you have any comments, questions, or reactions to pieces, feel free to throw them into the chat section. If we can't get them answered right now in an interactive manner, we'll be sure to look over them and put them on the recorded version that you'll find after we're done here today. The next work by Barb Bjornsson is called Goliath Heron. What an incredible piece. I'm having Susie get in there really tight on this piece because this is made, if you can believe it or not, with paper mache and watercolor paper. Take a minute to let that soak in. As the world's largest heron, this one is found in Africa and South Asia. They stand five feet high with a wingspan of about seven feet. This is one of two herons Barb has put in this show. Barb's a natural for the Arboretum. She works a lot with botanicals and animals in nature. I'm thrilled to have her as a part of our show here today. The next work by Kyle Falcon. Kyle's an artist who's won in numerous awards and grants and artist initiatives, outdoor sculpture commissions, and he's in museums and college galleries, art centers, private exhibitions, as well as many public and private collections. This piece, called Salt Pork, is part of his piggy bank series exploring the nature of where we put our money, salary, salt, etc., and what we value. What do we value? 
Do we value petroleum as it's represented in the uh, barrels that the pig is standing on? Do we, do we value that for energy? Or do we value the preservation of the earth more? It's works like this that get us to contemplate and think and have great discussions when we're looking at art. They're asking about the materials and the bird sculpture. The material, we're, we're being asked by Karen uh, what the materials were in the bird sculpture. That was paper mache and watercolor paper. We'll be seeing another example of that soon. The next work we have here is by George Moore. Two large pieces made out of uh, black walnut. One taller than the other. In this work, Moore had finished the mother, carved it from a single piece, but she needed a focus, he thought. He spotted a smaller, similar black walnut piece in the barn, and the answer became obvious. Mother and child has been a strong, symbolic motif of maternity, new growth, abundance, and creativity throughout art history. From Paleolithic figures, uh, of fertility to contemporary interpretations today. In this work, Moore states that he's produced a variation on the traditional theme in that the usual baby has become an adolescent and reflects the attitudes of her mother. Anyone with, who's ever had an adolescent in the house can totally relate to the uh, visual cues going on between mother and child in this piece. The next work we'll talk about is by Craig Snyder and it's called Binary. It's a colorful jumbled piece of cubes and in Craig, Craig says um, relates to computer code. Um, this may possibly hearken to Craig's other life in website development and computer programming. Many people might think that's uh, Craig using totally different parts of his brain. But in reality, the, the way you computer program, the way you would uh, have to develop websites are the same parts of your brain used to develop artwork. So I, I feel like Craig probably gets informed all day long, whether he's doing art or creating computer websites, uh, one informing the other. Susie's making sure that even though we won't be able to talk about all the pieces today, that all the pieces are being seen on this broadcast. We're so thankful that each artist submitted their pieces for this exhibition. And we, I'm just so sorry we don't have the time to go through each and every piece. The next work by Dennis Cowlow called Nature's Forces. Dennis says his personal challenge as a sculptor is to create pieces that demand attention and engage a viewer without depending on recognizable images or a verbal message. He says his concepts often start with something tangible, but his hope is to create a dialogue quite apart from what we might otherwise experience or think. I love that Dennis doesn't want to give us all the answers at the outset. I love that he's asking us to interpret for ourselves. That's what great art does. It makes us look and look again and think and rethink. It makes us have conversations with each other. Uh, right off the bat, when I saw this and, and I was led by the title called Nature's Forces, I was thinking of the Earth's movement and tectonic plates and things such as that. But you might have other ideas, and if so, throw them up on the chat board right now. I'm sure Dennis would love to see that, and I know I would, as well as the rest of the viewers today.
This playful work by Sung Hee Min is called Triangle Play. Immediately when I saw this work, I thought of my childhood jungle gym that was in my backyard. Mine was a geodesic dome and it was brightly colored. And we did, you could make it into a fort, you could play tag on it, you could climb, you could just study it. It could be a place of contemplation, um, a place of respite, or a place of joy and inclusion with many friends and neighbors. The difference in my geodesic dome was that it was one shape and it looked the same from all sides. Sung Hee's, on the other hand, looks different. It's three triangles adjusted in a unique way to give you a different vision as you look at it from every possible angle. It still offers that playfulness though, that bright colored red really influences how she'd like you to interpret it. Let's move over to a different form by Lenore Lampy. Lenore Ray Lampy has created these incredible pieces. I'll let Susie get up close and let you look at both um, installations on this wall. The intent of Lenora is to focus upon design eloquence. The possibilities here with form and movement have lent a fluidity to this series. Believe it or not, she starts with clay. Clay, you guys, this is clay, ceramic. And then she adds these various surface treatments, including color and glaze that make the, and then, and then these works undulate and reflect and twist. They seem to come alive. And for a person who spends her life at the Arboretum, they look like birch bark or tree trunks, leaves that have curled, which of course are part of all the living trees here at the Arboretum. They're beautiful, they're fascinating. They show this incredible talent and unique ideas. They are asking about the price on the pig piece. Okay, um, we'll have to get back to you on that. If you would like to know the particular prices of any of these pieces, if you could send me an email at depao008 at umn.edu. Again, if you're just joining us, my name is Wendy DePaulis and I'm the Curator of Art and Sculpture here at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Let's move to Jim Gabbard's two pieces in this other section, um, both in bronze and side by side. We talked about mother and child as being a, a, a very typical trope for uh, art history and doing it in a number of different ways. We um, saw George Moore's mother and adolescent child, and now we're looking at mother and baby. We see Mother Walking here by Jim Gabbard. It's a bronze, and the most important thing in this piece is that connection, the eyes between the mother and child. The, um, Gabbard says that this represents a mother protecting her baby from the wind while walking with strength into the future. And you can see that wind on the, blowing on the, on the uh, gown of the, the woman. But she's doing everything she can to keep that child out of the wind, out of the harm, out of danger, while giving her knowledge and confidence to move forward into the future. Right behind this, we have mother and baby. Again, the mother and child, but in a very, very different position. This is a maquette. A maquette is a model, um, and this is a model of a life-size work installed at the Mother Baby Center at Mercy Hospital in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. It's worth noting that the baby's heart is at the exact center of this ring. 
This is done with sensitivity. It's again a classic theme, but put in this ring, it, it adds this joyfulness and playfulness and love and connection between this mother and child that is so evident. It's like their whole world is within this ring. Everything outside it doesn't matter at this moment. Jim's got the whole thing balanced on her gown and her right toes. It's absolutely exquisite. Jim also has a number of works around the world in private and public collections, museums, outdoor installations, etc. Next, we'll focus on a totally different material with Lael McDill. How can you not look at McDill's whimsical sculptures and not smile? How can you look at these and not smile? They're just fun, they're fanciful, they're very Dr. Seussical to me. And in this case, this particular one um, reminds me of Gertrude McFuzz from Dr. Seuss. Lael works in polymer clay which is an ancient technique using oven-baked clay to create sculptural pieces. She exhibits and teaches her craft when she's not compulsively creating every day. And she loves working with this clay because it never dries out. It's a colored clay which she makes into long strips and then she mixes the colors together and puts them together like a puzzle. She slices up those strips and puts them um, in unique ways. She makes different types of animals, which we're gonna be looking at two types of those animals today. And she loves the cartoon nature, the whimsical creations, not realistic at all. This particular one is called Rain Cloud Bird Teapot. And it actually started with the buttons. So you can see these little buttons on the very bottom of this piece. And she attached them to the bottom of the teapot. And since those reminded her of clouds, she added some rain. So you can see the polymer clay with the rain coming down on the teapots. And then of course, she liked the idea of adding a branch to the handle because I should tell you, this is an actual teapot. You could see. So she took the handle and turned it into a giant branch. And that looked like a tail. So then of course the tail needed a beak. She likes the way that this is so many things at once. It's clouds, a tree, a bird, and a teapot all in the same time. It's one of those things that you just could never get tired of looking at. Every time you look at it, you discover something new. And of course, again, it's just happy, it makes you smile. Another one of Lael's we'll look at in a minute, but I'm going to have Susie uh, examine the pieces along the way before we get there. So now we're looking at elephant dreams of a rocket. And last summer, Lael created an elephant milfiori cane, which means a long strip of clay, and she sliced it up to reveal tiny pictures. She ended up with about 20 feet of these strips, all with tiny elephants. So she used some of these slices to cover a teapot that in turn turned out to be an elephant. So she ended up with an elephant made of elephants. And once you look closer at the uh, texture covering the teapot, you'll start to discover all the various elephants. Some are sideways, some are upside down. Um, and th so there's elephants within the elephant on the teapot. If you can see, um, maybe Susie can show one of the legs here. You can see two little eyes in the trunk right there of one of the myriad of elephants on this. But then she thought, what do I put on a lid, on the lid? Hmm. A rocket, of course. And for Lael, this piece tells the story that we all know to be true. That sometimes we just wish we could leave on a rocket. But as much as we wish we could, we have to stick around and solve the problems we've created on this little planet. I 
promised I'd show you Barb's other heron. Um, this is the great blue heron, and many of you may have seen this. So the other one we showed you was found in Africa and Southeast Asia. This one's found right here in Minnesota, March through October, often in the wetlands. A little bit smaller than the Goliath. These stand about four feet tall with a wingspan of six feet. Again, this sculpture is made with paper mache and watercolor paper. You have to see this close up. Oh, it's gorgeous. The observer notes the accurate representation of this beautiful bird. And in this case, the bird's got its beak a little bit open and perhaps about to uh, start fishing, which the herons do by just standing very still in the water and then spearing their prey with open upper and lower beak. In stark contrast, um, stark contrast to Lenora's last piece we saw hanging on the wall, which were those pieces that I commented looked like um, birch bark and, and tree bark, this is a different series. Um, this is a series that focuses on the notion of adornment of the affordable kind. Ribbons and bows and streamers, maybe in a historical context, might evoke feelings of nostalgia and kitsch and pomp. But Lenora says this allows her to reference pop art, to describe the work. Um, she loves the idea that you can monumentalize these humble objects. Think Andy Warhol in his soup cans. This piece is called Inverted Bling. And what's incredible again is this is made of clay. You guys, this is ceramic. She has done, um, gotten this, this uh, glaze uh, to, to show like that it's a reflection to make it look like it's bronze. I love that she's taking ceramics that for a long time um, may have not been given the highest form of art, but it definitely has its due respect and recognition in her hands. She says she likes being led by the material. And as you may or may not know, clay is a living, breathing um, material to work with. It comes from the earth. So the idea that she's being led to create new things and working in concert with it is really exciting to me. With ceramics, she says she can draw in three dimensions. And again, the surfaces and the glazes and the colors take to this material like no other. The next piece we'll look at is by Cynthia Anderson. Cynthia, as many people in Minnesota, grew up in a rural setting, small town, and for her, that's the inspiration for much of her work. The natural outdoors gave way to exploration, and then exploration gave way to creative expression. Cynthia's drawn to steel and stone and kiln-formed glass as her main mediums, but she works with a large range of mediums as her works dictate. This is a rare beauty in found materials. She loves that idea of taking things that were previously used and diminished or discarded, and then once again, putting them together and making them useful, creating beauty, which gives her joy. That idea of creating something out of nothing, or even worse, something that's been discarded, is an incredible interpretation for all of us to pay attention to those discarded, unused, thrown away things um, that, that our society deems as such. Again, these were found in, her, in the rural countryside and given a second life. The next piece by Dennis Callow, It Fell From the Sky. Again, if you want to throw on the chat room what this reminds you of, go for it. It fell from the sky leads me to think um, that he's combined this uh, wood, and in this case, oak and stone, and looks like a meteorite that landed 
Um, it could be ripples on the water, or he's etched in topography of the land where the stone has landed. Those are just my thoughts though. Feel free to share yours and let others see what you're thinking. The next pieces we'll be looking at are Kyle Fokens, September Morn, and A Walk in the Woods. They're both part of his Northern Fox series. They're made out of mixed media. There's a lot of wood carving that he's used in this incredible piecing of the wood. Um, some of them just reference a almost an up north cabin feeling. Some might say a, a folk art if you uh, look at the cardinal up here in the tree. There feels to be a very Minnesota connection to these pieces for me. And the fact that he's um, the walk in the woods, September morn with the leaves falling, these are all things that happen and that Minnesotans are really familiar with. In that playful, this playful piece with the fox and the little rabbit, it's a depiction of the hunter and the prey and the observations of those outside the drama. So you and I can just cheer for the rabbit as the fox is looking the other way in hopes that he'll escape. And then how playful to have the fox in the boat on the September morn instead of a fisherman um, to have the fox actually being the fisherman, perhaps again in the hunter role. Kyle is watching. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for watching today. The next one we're going to look at is John Camera's giant work here in the show. John's an instructor and sculptor who works in clay and metal and wood. This one is untitled. John said he likes to think of scaffolding as the visual representation of the societal and personal support structures we all use in our lives. We often take for granted the permanence of things such as relationships, health, or the environment and build up elaborate structures upon them, assuming that they're gonna be there forever, assuming their longevity and eternal support. But events such as health crises or environmental change or what we're going through right now highlight the fragility and the fleeting nature of these structures we've built. I love that when you look at John's piece, you think of a birdhouse or something playful or maybe a treehouse. It looks like a ladder and something you can access. And then when you hear his interpretation, it just makes you think and gives you a window into the artist's world that you wouldn't have otherwise. The next one, Craig Snyder's Stardust, It's Full of Stars, is an exploration into color. Color is a big part of Craig's work, and he often uses the paint and patina to create these eye-catching and interesting pieces. In this case, he's got the, the paint and the patina to draw you in, and then once you're there, you start looking at the cutouts. To me, some of them look very natural, a lot of plant forms, organic elements to it, all three sides. And I should mention that these sculptures are meant to be seen in the round. All three sides of Craig's sculpture is decidedly different. Each one the artist thinks about, they work with, they understand, and they develop and present um, in a way that is, feels right to them. So Susie will walk around this for a moment just to give you a glimpse. 
of all three sides, or all four sides. Three. Yesterday, as I was walking through this show again, I came by Kristen Levin's work called Bird on a Nest. And it struck me because we have ospreys that are nesting right now. We have an osprey cam that you will be able to see on the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum website, as well as Facebook page periodically. And um, it's always a favorite uh, of viewers, members, donors, visitors alike who know that this cam's available. Um, in past years, we've gotten to see the, the which right now there are, we, we, you can see the ospreys in the nest, but we get to see their eggs. We get to see the parents feeding the birds right up until they leave the nest. So I hope you'll uh, check back frequently onto our website, onto our Facebook page, and look for the birds on the nest, which happens to be what Kristen Levin called this piece. Now this piece is uh, bronze and honey calcite on granite. So the abstraction when you first walk by this piece is, is, uh, is incredible. She's got this form that to me looks like a woman with her back arching but then, of course, when you see bird on a nest, you see the beak and the bird turning um, to face backwards. You've got the, the egg on the nest in the front. But again, when I look at the front of this, it's so organic and natural. It could be the texture that she's put inside the bird looks like a palm frond. Um, so it's just, uh, you can keep looking and questioning, and the fact that she's mixed natural materials like this make it ever more interesting. Now we're going to head over to our third grouping of sculpture. Oh, I'd like you to take a look at Robert Debray's Eterna Fold. This is a large piece. It's a bronze casting. And the observer will notice a lot of Christian symbolism in this work. So we've got Jesus at the center of this work. We've got Alpha and Omega, beginning and end written symbolically. The observer will notice that all of the sheep which surround the exterior of the circle in two full uh, lines or rows um, are focused on the shepherd. They listen and they recognize his voice and they follow only his directives. And by doing this, they have a safe passage home. So classically, um, when you think about Renaissance art, etc., that was put in the church, there was so many symbols used to communicate words and ideas and expressions and stories, and this is what Robert's doing here. It's something you could look at and ponder time and time again and meditate on. We have a piece by Sung Hee Min called Q, which is a metal sculpture welded together, um, uh, these thin square steel plates put together to form a cube. And the piece looks open and weightless despite the inherent nature and the heaviness in steel. 
So again, it's this dichotomy and contradiction. If I, if I lifted that up, would it be heavy? Would it be light? It's hard to, um, to know. She's got the weightlessness feel to it that looks as light as aluminum foil, but weight, steel, that's often really heavy. So just a fun play with materials here. If we turn around, we see a sculpture by Amy and Dan Wolbert, as well as Bryce Borkuth, called Have You Ever Met a Normal Person? Did you like it? This is bronze, glass, and stone. And from dust to dust, they say, we're all made from the same stuff of life. These artists talk about how there's minor differences from person to person in height, shape, ability, and color. But in nature, that's normal. Our differences are man implied, not rooted in nature. And in the beginning, and in the end, we're all the same. This is a good example of art moving away from the decorative purpose to involve social engagement, political motives perhaps, discussion at the very least. So all you Facebook Live people, what do you think of art's ability to affect change, to make people rethink norms? It's works like this when we observe them in a group setting that inspire excellent discussion. As Susie walks up to Addie Motzko's Princess Victoria, I want you to look at the uh, scarf blowing in the wind of this tightrope walker and understand that Addie did this with steel. She's got that uh, way about making steel, again, look weightless and giving it movement and form that is so difficult to do. Princess Victoria is named after an actual person who at six years old walked her first tightrope as part of a circus family. In the 1920s, she was part of, um, I'm sorry, 1909, she was part of Barnum and Bailey's circus. Again, I'll remind you that most of these sculptures are for sale. And if you are interested in purchasing, simply uh, send me an email at depao008 at umn.edu. And I'm Wendy DePaulis, Curator of Art and Sculpture here at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Again, thank you for joining us. We've got a couple more to go. And uh, again, just thank you for hanging in there. The next one we're going to look at is by George Moore. It's called The Belly. And this is one George began carving in the 90s, but he put it aside several times. Finally, he was inspired to finish it when he heard this poem by Mary Logue of Stockholm, Wisconsin. This is part of a recent poetry collection that Mary's just published entitled Heartwood. The poem goes like this. The navel is our epicenter, the port through which we received our first love, a mix of warm blood and gentle touch. If you try to attain that radiant feast again, all you get is snatches. Put your hands over your belly. It's an ocean that swells and falls. While we can never go back to what we had, we can bring it with us. Goodness and mercy, lighter than air. As you look at this piece, contemplate what may have transpired from poem to sculpture. What inspired George when he heard that poem to finish this walnut sculpture? And 
What better way to end the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum Tour today than with a trip outside to see our last artwork. It is a gorgeous spring day. Normally, we would have thousands of people on the grounds looking at the blooming flowers, uh, hiking the trails, listening to the birds, which are very active. But today, it's just you and me, Facebook Live. We do have a number of daffodils blooming. We have um, minor bulbs blooming here. We even have one couple tulips that have chosen to open just today for us. The last piece by Molly Barrett. It, she calls it spring and says it's the perfect Minnesota flower. Spring, summer, winter, and fall, this impressive piece will add color and conversation to your landscape. The industrial spring has sprung. You can see as she's put these found materials together with steel and stone and welded and bended to create these fun, beautiful um, additions to the Arboretum for now um, and the backdrop of the daffodils and tulips really highlight the yellows in this sculpture. It really has become a fun backdrop and indication of, of what's inside. And I hope that we'll be able to leave this sculpture show up for at least a couple weeks whenever we reopen. It depends on schedules of other events and things like that, but I'm, we're really hoping that when, you, um, when we do reopen, you'll come out and be able to see this show live. I'd really like to thank you all for tuning in today. Please check the website for the latest information. That's at arb.umn.edu or jo join us on the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum Facebook page. Again, feel free to email me directly with any comments at depao008 um, at umn.edu. There it is in writing. Thank you again for hanging in there They're with us. They're saying they can't hear us out here. Let's go in. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Well, let's kind of do your ender in here. Go back and... Thank you for hanging in there with us, and we look forward to seeing you at the Arboretum. Have a wonderful day.